William Forsyth in general. The characters that you play are not the most friendly people on the planet. He's shaking his head no. Tell me why. Basically, you know, any part that I play, I try to commit to 100%. I mean, if, if, if he's on the dark side, I go dark. If he's if I, on the other side, I go the other way. I mean, it's just a question of commitment. I mean, as far as image goes, I mean, that's all Hollywood bull. You know, it's just like some of the, the most amazing people, amazing actors I know are the people who, who are, aren't afraid to go to that side. You know, so I don't particularly relate to being villainous because I'm not. You know, if anything, I'm a knight for good. Yes. You've worked with some really notable directors. Rob Zombie, the Coen brothers. Sergio Ed, Ed, Leone, John Frankenheimer, Walter Hill, Paul Schrader, Warren Beatty, and many other good ones. Can you talk about the difference between a couple styles? Warren Beatty and Sergio Leone, for instance, were the two directors I worked with that were, they really loved doing a lot of takes. When I worked with Sergio, our average amount of takes we would do were in the 20s, and I believe one time we, we did as many as 90-something takes on one angle of a scene. Warren was similar to that. Warren liked to shoot a lot, and he, you know, and he loved to. But but then again, those two guys are very meticulous. I think Warren is an amazing director. In some ways, I think underrated as a director because I think he's phenomenal. Sergio was the greatest guy I've ever known. His sense of detail in a movie, it, it just was mesmerizing. He, if you had a room with a thousand people, he would not miss a trick. If there was one thing out of place, because it, for him it was a painting, each scene. And so his attention to detail was just absolutely amazing. But everyone has a different personality, you know, when you're working on the sets. Everybody is all different. You have people that are very, you know, wild and loud and scream all the time. And nobody listens to them because, you know, when you scream, people turn you off. Then you've got the soft-spoken, amazing people. You know, all great directors have one thing, a sense of vision. And the smarts to know that 90% of what you do is who you hire and allowing them to do what they do. Rob's that kind of director. Rob Zombie, to me, is an amazing director that could direct any kind of film he wants to do. He's very smart. His sense of what he wants to do, he knows exactly what he wants to do, and he trusts the people that he goes with. And, and that's why I love Rob. And any movie he makes, I'll do with him if he wants me to. So. I'm sure you probably will. So you're in the remake of Halloween very briefly, but an amazing character is that yeah, Rob, opening Rob scene. Was, Rob was like, yeah, would you listen? Would you come and do this film? And, you know, and uh, I've got this part I'd like you to do. It'll only be for, you know, a week, a few days or something like that. And I'm like, oh, cool, whatever. I'm, you know, little did I know his, his plan was, you know, that I'm going to be the guy that sends Mike Myers out to like, you know, for the last 30 years, I'm the reason he's been out killing everyone. I mean, all the years I watched Halloween movies, I didn't realize it was me. So, you know. It was me. It was me. Dirty Ronnie White. You know, sweetheart, nicest guy that ever lived and available for all babysitting jobs in the future in case anybody in the audience out there would like a babysitter. Ronnie's Good ready. to know. Ronnie's ready. Any uh, stories about being on that set? Uh, it was pretty funny because, you know, Rob and I have this funny relationship. I mean, he, he lets me go. I mean, I would ad lib things like when I did the Devil's Rejects, I mean, there were things that, you know, he would just go do. do. And when he got to Halloween, he was like, okay, do it different. Say something else. So every one of those takes where I turn on Sherry or I turn, it was just like going off, create, making up things, bitch, I will crawl over there, you know, I mean, and which is funny because that's my most requested line for an autograph from Halloween. I have to laugh. You know, and uh, it's going to be a requested line for radio, also. Yeah, and 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 Dag was an amazing kid because he's so smart and such a good kid, and it was funny. I could tell right away, like. I would just poke him, push his button a little in the scene, and then finally I knew I got to him when he turned around and just hit my cast. You know, it was just like perfect. You know, I, I was just hitting him till he would get to that point, and he did. And he's a great kid. I love him. You know. It sounds like you're doing a little directing on your own then. <laughs> uh, it's part of the fun. You know, you work with all kinds of actors and things like that, and part of it is when you're in a scene, how to push a button. You know, because then acting goes away and it becomes, you know, like the real deal. So, you well, that's know. That's what you want. Absolutely. A little grudge. Never hurt anybody, especially behind the camera. Yeah. The filming of American Me was not done on set, correct? We shot on location. We shot in Folsom Prison. We shot in Los Angeles and we shot everywhere like that. No, there was no real studio work on that film. We were all out and, and doing it, yeah. And there were a lot of gang members 
genuine gang members in the movie. Wow. Is that That's definitely something that I don't really know exactly in terms of details, but definitely we were in the middle of, of the world and, you know, and making the movie. So, I mean, it, so how did that differ, being really in like a neighborhood making a movie as opposed to being on a set? Was there more tension? or? <clears throat> that movie is a very tense film. It's a very intense film. And, and, and it's just, I think it's an amazing movie. It was grueling and tough to make, but yet it was an amazing, rewarding experience. I mean, for me to go on that journey and literally become that guy, you know, was a process that was about five months altogether for me. It was a, a very wild ride in terms of what we had to do and everything. I mean, there were some tense moments and things like that, but, you know, I'm very proud of that movie and I'm very happy I made it. You had your head shaved for five months? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was funny. Um, I had an interview with Eddie, and I came in. I had just finished doing the water dance, and I was huge. I was huge. I, I think I was weighing like 250, 260 or something. And I was in the middle of having this meeting with Eddie, and I could tell it was just now being a courtesy you know, meeting, and there was no way I was going to end up getting this part. And, oh, yeah, it was like he was looking at me. Yeah, this fat guy, yeah, right. And so, you know, I looked at Eddie at one point, and, you know, I always was really into the culture. And I used to go down when I first moved to L.A., and I would go down to, like, East Los and places like that on Sundays and go eat the menudo with people. And just I was really into it. And so I really, prior to that movie, had a sense of how people speak and, and the dialect and all those things. So at one point I could tell this meeting was going away, and I turned on Eddie. And, and I looked at him and I went, get me to Budweiser's homes. And he went, and he looked at me and I said, I told you I want, you know. And I went off on him and Eddie just looked at me and he goes, how do you do that? He said, you know, and I said, I just don't. And he goes, and then he goes, can you lose the weight? <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And, but what was happening was now they wanted me to do it. And so Eddie hired some guy to train me, and they were starving me. I mean, literally, I was like, he, they were trying to feed me 500 calories and do all these workouts. And I was, and and I know how to do it, and and I was like, this is not working. I'm really hurting myself. So I basically, you know, told my, I, I told Mike I wouldn't work with these guys anymore. And then every day, how's it going? How's the weight? You know, you're losing the, you know. And I'm like, finally, I stopped answering the phone. And I turned off my phones, and I wouldn't answer anyone in production, and I went off for like 30 days, and, you know, and I ended up, by the time it was over with, I dropped like 60 pounds and, and became, you know, J.D. And, and, it was, and then I, I shaved my head, and I walked in to see Eddie. So the last time he saw me, I had long hair, and I was, you know, whatever, weird hair, and just, you know, looking like this. And then I walked in, and I was like, you know, the guy in Eddie went, okay. You know. Got it. Yeah, okay. Eddie's an awesome cat. I mean, he's a caring, great guy, and, and I'm proud to have done the movie. That's all, you know, so. Thinking of authoring a diet book? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I could. I could. I'm pretty good at uh, gaining and losing weight, you know. You have to be in this business, yeah, I mean, depending well, on what, you I know. change. I mean, I don't know why. I mean, I try to do everything I do. I try to make it a different person, and I don't know why I do it exactly the way I do, but I, I do. I mean, I like to make every character a different person, particularly if I have the time. Nowadays, you know, I don't know what it is, be it the corporate movie business or whatever it is, but they wait till like, the day before to offer you a part. And I look at him and I go, are you out of your mind? I had a movie last year. They wanted me to play a Greek guy. And they offered the movie to me three days before. So I moved. You do research for that. Well, I moved into the great Greek restaurant. I moved in there and all my friends that I knew. And I basically said, guys, you got to teach me Greek. I mean, i got to learn Greek in three days. And I did. And, but it was like, but well, wouldn't it have been a lot better to have three weeks or a month or something like that to do that kind of work? And I don't, I don't even understand why. I mean, I don't know what the practical benefit of doing it that way is, and it happens more and more these days. I would always get a month or two months or three months to prepare a part. And now, on occasion, I get that. But quite often, it's, you know, I just got a call. They wanted me to show up, like, you know, right up from here, go down to a movie. And they've known about the movie forever. It's weird. I would think you need time to, you want to get into character and research who you want to be, unless they're just going to give you lines and just not let you be you. The more time you have, the more preparation, the more of, of that thing that you do, the better your character is, the better the movie is. I don't understand why or what it is. I'm probably the worst person to ask. I personally think the details and the spices that went into making great film 
of the of the good old days, which I live on TCM. I live on channels like that because I live in that world where the attention to detail in movies was so amazing. Nowadays, they make a movie. Say they're going to do a western. They get six guys who graduated Beverly Hills High who look like they have a cap gun and a hat on to play it. Where's Lee Marvin? You know, where's Steve McQueen? Where are the guys? Where's the guys of my generation who are the better actors? Why aren't they playing those roles? I mean, why is it the way it is? I don't know. It's, uh, it's pop culture, and, you know, which I despise. Since you're a classic film buff. I was a huge Jimmy Cagney fan. I'm, I love James Cagney, and I loved Gary Cooper. You know, I don't know why. This is when I was a little boy. I was obsessed with those guys. I love Humphrey Bogart. I love those kind of actors that just bring something that you just don't see today. And it's just a sense of, you know. Today, when you watch movies, you see guys holding guns. They don't look like they know what they're doing. You see guys pointing their guns sideways in your face and all these things. Watch the old movies. Watch how the guys handled their guns. Just that alone. A sense of reality that you just don't have. Not enough of. Not enough of. I mean, of course, we have them. I mean, I mean we've got Daniel Day-Lewis, and he puts out there... And he puts a performance and he goes to the wall and, you know, and I love and respect him because of that. And other guys, I mean, there's plenty of great actors, but you know what? The greatest actors of our generation don't work enough. They don't work, I mean, they work, but they're not heralded as they would have been in other generations. The scene where uh, Sheriff Rydell is in the cell with Mother Firefly, really tough scene. Can you tell me about that a little bit? Well, that, that was a very intense scene, and it had, to, it had to bear physical violence, and it had to be that kind of a thing. And, of course, you have to make it look like it's the most violent thing in the world, and, and of course, it's not. And it's quite challenging, because at the end of the day, every film I do, when the movie's over, I'm black, I'm blue, my knee hurt. You really put out your time when you make movies. And that was such an intense scene. And Leslie, you know, ball breaker that she is, she shows up the next day with a neck brace on. And, and, and you know, and they're all playing. And, and I looked and I said, the hell with you. I said, you know, there's no way I hurt you, you know. I'm good at not hurting you and looking like it, you know. And this is what I do. But it was funny, you were breaking my chops. And I was like, oh, the hell with you, man. Let's do the scene again. So. And for the record, William Forsyth is in great shape. You're not carrying any extra weight. Because we were talking about that before. Yeah. Oh, you're very svelte. And, and uh, it's the spectacles that make you look studious and... I am you know. studious. I know, and I'm I know, evil. I know, I can't help I it. I put my glasses the other night, so I've been <laughs> having, yeah, and I had just been bragging. I had these Ray-Bans, and I've been bragging how they were, like, unbreakable, and so I, I left them on the floor, got up in the middle of the night, and crushed them, so I've been sort of half-seeing the rest of the festival. Any guilty pleasures? Guilty pleasures? Plenty. <laughs> uh, hobbies, let's say. You know, one of my favorite things to do is to travel and go on adventures. I've always been very oriented down. Sometimes I, I've even, I said to somebody, I've, I think I've lived part of my life like Errol Flynn. I love the road less traveled. I do a lot of traveling to places. Like I've been going to Costa Rica lately, and I don't go to where everyone goes. I go into the rainforest, and I go into places like that. I love going on those adventures. When the year uh, that the Berlin Wall came down, I called up my friend Andrew Divoff, who is a great actor as well, and I said, Andrew, I was like, to turn the Berlin Wall down, I said, this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience, shall we? And he goes, yes. So we took off, and for the whole week, we tore the Berlin Wall down. So I'm, I'm obsessed with adventures like that. Those are the kind of things I like to do. So. Skydiving. No, I don't. I'm not. You know, no. That's my idea of a nightmare: jumping out of a plane, or, or my favorite or one. A film. Well, my favorite one of the guys who like jump off a bridge with a rubber band around their leg. Oh. Forget it, man. I take my adventures in a different way. I love it. Awesome. Well, great. Thank you so much for talking to us. Awesome. You're very welcome, darling. Very welcome, darling.